Reason tells us we're going to die. Experience tells us we're going to die. And if you're not prepared to die, you're not prepared to live. No man is ever ready for life until he is no longer afraid of death. Now, we human beings are kind of humorous. We're interested in the origin of a species. Well, friend, we ought to be more interested in the destiny of the species. From whence we've come, that's settled. But uh, where we're going, that is not yet settled. There was a time when you were not. There never will be a time when you will not be. And so you need to uh, consider today with me your eternal destiny. Profound truth simply stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Would you take your Bibles and find Luke chapter 16? And uh, we're going to talk about an unpleasant uh, subject today, at least unpleasant for some, and that is the subject of death. Death is a very real subject, and man is the uh, only creature who knows that he's going to die. And he's trying desperately to forget it. If you mention death in some circumstances, they will change the subject like people change the channels uh, with their remote control. They don't want to talk about death. They don't want to face death. Uh, but reason tells us we're going to die. Experience tells us we're going to die. And if you're not prepared to die, you're not prepared to live. No man is ever ready for life until he is no longer afraid of death. Now, we human beings are <laughs> kind of humorous. We're interested in the origin of a species. Well, friend, we ought to be more interested in the destiny of the species. I mean, where we, from whence we've come, that's settled. But uh, where we're going, that is not yet settled. There was a time when you were not. There never will be a time when you will not be. And so you need to uh, consider today with me your eternal destiny. The title of our message today is Five Minutes After Death. And I direct your attention now to verse 19, this story that Jesus told that deals with these three great issues. Jesus says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all of this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now what we have here is a story by the master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say that this story is a parable. I doubt that it is a parable. Jesus does not call it a parable. 
Uh, Luke does not call it a parable. If this is a parable, it's the only parable that Jesus ever gave when he mentioned someone's name. He mentions the name of a man, Lazarus. Deals with him as though he is an actual individual. But whether it is a parable or not, the truth is there in parabolic form or in historical form. It is a truth that fell from the lips of the greatest teacher that ever lived. His name is Jesus. And when we look at this story, uh, it's a story of contrasts. He's contrasting two men. He's contrasting their life. He's contrasting their death. And he is contrasting the destiny. Now, I want you to see, first of all, the contrast in life. Beginning in verse 9, you're going to find out that these men are very different. One was a rich man. One was a poor man. One had more uh, materially than heart could wish. The other had not even enough to subsist. But we see a contrast in life. Uh, there are these inequities in life. The rich man and the poor man. But now Jesus goes on, and not only does he speak about a contrast in life, but he speaks about a contrast in death. Now, when uh, the, the beggar died, the Bible doesn't even say he was buried. It says the rich man was buried. You know what they did with beggars and people of that day? It's horrible, but they would haul them off and throw them in the garbage heap to burn and, and, uh, and just to be consumed and uh, they wouldn't even have many times a burial. Nobody wanted to bury them. Sometimes the dogs would eat them. But the rich man was buried. If it had been today, it had been a silk lined casket. Had it would have been today, there would have been a number of fine priced automobiles out in front of uh, the synagogue or the church or wherever it was. Uh, <laughs> there would have been a profusion of flowers from one side to the other, a jungle, a riot of color. The air would be filled with perfume. Doubtless one of the greatest speakers would be there to eulogize the man. And one by one, the people would, as they would dab their eyes, would say, he was a good man. <laughs> he was a good man. Our community will miss him. Not understanding the Bible says there is none good, no not one. And all of their words would not change his destiny. And all of the finery would not change his destiny for his soul was in hell before the undertaker knew he was dead. Now there was a contrast, a contrast in life and a contrast in death. But I want to get to the major thing. There's a contrast in eternity. Look, if you will, again in verse uh, 23 of this chapter. And uh, verse 22 says, The rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. A contrast in eternity. Now Jesus does what no one else can do. What Jesus does here is to pull back the curtain and let us look to the other side. First of all, you see what we call the glories of heaven. The beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. When he died, there was an angel convoy that, come, that came and took him away to a place called Abraham's bosom. What does that mean, Abraham's bosom? That's strange. Well, Abraham was the father of the faithful, the, the, the most revered of the Jewish leaders, the brightest star in the, in the heavenly kingdom for these Jews. To be with Abraham would be a place of incredible honor. Now, what does it mean to be in Abraham's bosom? Well, when people had a banquet of that day, they would not sit around the table as we sit around the table. They would recline. And uh, the, the, the best place would be where you would recline, where your head would be near the chest, the bosom of the host. What, what he was saying is here, this man who's been feeding on crumbs is now at a banquet. And not only is he at a banquet, he is in a banquet at the very highest place of honor. 
What Jesus is, is showing is, this is a great radical change that took place this man as he's carried by the angels to heaven. Now, if you're not saved, let me tell you something. I'm not trying to talk you into something grotesque, evil, vile, or bad. I'm not inviting you to a funeral. I'm inviting you to a feast. That's what our Lord is talking about. He's talking here about the epitome of glory when he says this man is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, I would like to spend a lot of time today talking about heaven. But I'm afraid we speak too much about heaven and not enough about hell, so I'm going to spend just a little time here talking about uh, the beggar in Abraham's bosom. What is heaven? Let me just put it in several sentences. Heaven is all that the all-beneficent, loving heart of God would desire for you. Heaven is all that the omniscient mind of God could design for you. Heaven is all that the omnipotent hand of God could prepare for you. Heaven will be just right. When I was a little boy, I used to think, well, you know, maybe I don't want to go to heaven, at least not right now, because I worried, would they have any swimming in heaven? Would you be able to fish in heaven? Uh, uh, would you, could you play baseball in heaven? Have you ever thought about that? Uh, when, when you're a child especially and think, well, you know, heaven is sort of a, the next best place, but it'd be a little better to, to stay here. Don't be so foolish. Uh, Billy, Billy Graham was on Johnny Carson's show one time, and Johnny Carson said to him, uh, Billy, if I go to heaven, will there be golf in heaven? And Billy said, Johnny, if you get to heaven... And golf is necessary for your joy. There will be golf in heaven. That was a great answer. It was a great answer. Now, don't go, anybody go around saying, I said it's going to be golf in heaven. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I am saying, dear friend, that you will not have a longing, a desire that heaven will not fulfill more than you can imagine. And I wish I had more time to talk about the glories of heaven. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the agonies of hell as we talk about uh, five minutes after death. And my task when I talk to you about hell is not an easy one. Hell is the, uh, the butt of jokes, the idea of ridicule. About the only time you see anything about hell today is in the, in the comic pages today. Uh, a preacher who preaches on hell is, is looked upon as either ignorant or cruel are both. You say, well, Adrian, you're not going to preach on hell today, are you? I, I thought you were educated. Haven't you been to school? I've been accused of that. Yeah, I've been to school. But I believe in hell. You know, let me tell you why I believe in hell. Number one, because Jesus teaches it. Now, if you ever ridicule a preacher for being a hellfire preacher, you are ridiculing the Lord Jesus Christ. There are at least 162 texts in the New Testament that speak of hell and the judgment of the lost. Over 70 of these were issued by Jesus Christ himself. I believe in hell because I believe in Jesus. But not only does, uh, do the words of Jesus teach that there's a hell, the death of Jesus demonstrates that there, was a, there is a hell. Now, be reasonable. If there is no hell from which men need to be saved, why did Jesus die? If there is no hell, then Calvary is the blunder of the ages. May I tell you that by the spit that they placed into the face of Jesus, by every lash that was laid upon his back, by every thorn that pierced his brow, by the agony and the utter midnight of Calvary, there is a hell. Why did Jesus die if there is no hell? I believe in hell because the justice of God demands it. Do you believe that a man can be a rapist, a murderer, or whatever, commit suicide, and it's all over? No. There's a judgment to face. Uh, it, there, there's, there must be a time when things are made right, uh, when, when uh, 
Equity does come. Somebody says, I hate the idea of hell. That, well, I do too. But it's a fact. I'm sure that it broke the heart of the Lord Jesus. But it's a fact. You may hate rats and snakes, but they're facts. The fact that you hate something, disbelief in hell does not change it. Now, Jesus tells us what hell will be like, and I want you to listen. Hell is a place of misery. It's a place of sensual misery. You will feel in hell. In these verses that I read, in verse 23, 24, and 25, three times Jesus mentions the word torment. Hell is a place of torment. You're going to be tormented if you go to hell. Uh, from time immemorial, people have been asking, do you believe in literal fire in hell? Let me put it this way. I believe in real fire in hell. Real fire. Whatever it is, whether Jesus is speaking here in a metaphor of something that is even worse than the literal thing, it makes no difference. Jesus used the word fire. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, if you don't like the idea of fire in hell, uh, take it up with Jesus. Don't take it up with Adrian because I'm just reading the Word of God today. Jesus spoke of fire. I had much rather Jesus say to me, Adrian, you took my word too literally than to say, Adrian, you explained it away. Now, whatever it is, whatever Jesus intends to convey by using the word fire, may I tell you, friend, you do not want to go there. And not only is there going to be that sensual misery, there will be that e emotional misery. Verse 25, Abraham says to this rich man, Son, remember. Did you know that if you go to hell, you'll take your memory with you? Uh, psychologists tell us that we never, ever really, truly forget anything. Memory will sting like a hornet in hell. You will remember this service. You will remember this sermon. You will remember the prayers of your mother. You will remember every opportunity you had to be saved. And every time you said, stubbornly said no to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man who said to a wise man, I'll, for $100, I will teach you how to remember things. The wise man said, I'll give you $1,000 if you teach me how to forget some things. But in hell you will remember. And then not only is there that sensual uh, misery, not only is there that emotional misery, there is an eternal misery. In, in verse 26, Abraham said, look, you can't come over here. We can't go over there. There is a great gulf fixed. There is a chasm between the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, in this life, that chasm can be spanned. Thank God for the cross, where if you're on one side, you can come to the other side. And I love that song called Calvary. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. But do you know what this verse teaches us in verse 26? There is no second chance. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. There is the, there's the uh, eternal misery. There's the spiritual misery. Verses 27 through 29, this man in hell says, But look, I've got five brothers. Send somebody that he might witness to my brothers. Send Lazarus. Why, if somebody rose from the dead, they'd believe. Of course, Jesus was prophesying the fact that though he would suffer, bleed, die, and rise from the dead, people still will not believe. And he said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Old Testament. If they won't believe that, they would not believe the one rose from the dead. Now, the sad thing is this, that this man in hell is now beginning to be concerned about his loved ones. It's too late. 
Do you know what's wrong with many of us in this building today? We're going to wait till it's too late to be concerned about our loved ones. A woman called me on the phone. She said, Pastor, 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 Pastor. She was hysterical. I said, hold it. Get hold of yourself. She said, Pastor. I said, what is wrong? She said, my daddy is in hell. My daddy is in hell. My daddy is in hell. I said, what makes you think your daddy is in hell? She said, my daddy died this morning. My daddy was not saved. My daddy is in hell. I said, your daddy's not in hell. She said, yes. My daddy wasn't saved. I said, no, your daddy was saved. I said, I went by last week and talked to your daddy. Her daddy was a medical doctor. I asked your daddy if he knew Jesus, and he said no. I asked him if he wanted to be saved. He said yes. And I said, I prayed with your daddy. Your daddy gave his heart to Jesus Christ, put his hand in mine, and told me that he trusted Christ as his personal Savior. I said, your daddy is not in hell. Your daddy's in heaven. But I want to ask you a question. Did you witness to your dad? She said, I was going to. I was going to. I said, had it been up to you, your daddy would have been in hell. Do you have a loved one, somebody that you're going to speak to about this? Here's a man too late saying, send somebody to speak to my brothers about this thing. Oh, the spiritual misery of hell. Now, I must close this message. But I want to tell you something, friend. Listen to me. There is a hell. Five minutes after you die, you will be in hell and you will never come out. To get to hell, you're going to have to struggle to get there. If you go to hell, you'll have to work to go to hell. You'll take more difficulty to go to hell than you would go to heaven. You say, why do you say that? You'll have to climb over some mountains to get to hell. You'll have to climb over this service the music that we've sung, the prayers that we've prayed. You have to climb over God's Word that I've held in my hand today and preached to you. You're going to have to put this under your feet and climb over it in order to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over your own conscience that is telling you right now, maybe I ought to give my heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. You're going to have to climb over that to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's in this building today because I have prayed and asked God to speak. And I know God's Holy Spirit is working today. You're going to have to climb over that in order to get to hell. If you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to climb over Mount Calvary in order to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over the prayers of these people who have prayed for you that you might go to heaven. You're going to have to climb over those prayers in order to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over your better judgment to get to hell. But once you get there, you will not come out. But where, oh where will my spirit be? five minutes after I die. This may be the last worship service you'll ever be in. This may be the last gospel message you'll ever hear. So I want to put it to you big and plain and straight. You don't have to go to hell. You can be saved. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus invites you. And whosoever will may come. And I promise you on the authority of this book that I preach from, if today in repentance and faith you will give your heart to Jesus Christ, sir, he will save you. Lady, he will save you and he will keep you saved for all eternity. And Don't gamble with your destiny. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Heads are bowed. And eyes are closed. Would you begin to pray for those round about you who may not know the Lord Jesus? I would ask that no one stirring, no one moving unless it is an emergency. Father God, I pray today that many will come to Jesus. And Lord, that they'll not wonder about other people. 
that they will lay any pride in the dust. And Lord, that they might humbly and joyfully acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior. In his name I pray. Amen.